so today's message is called the terminal generation and we've just kept the feast of passover and unleavened bread and at the seder we try to touch on uh, many of the connections between the exodus and the establishment of the new covenant and messiah's blood both accounts are rich and full of meaning but we don't usually have the luxury to ex explore all of the details due to time constraints. Both accounts look back to a time uh, that judgment fell and passed over Yah's people. But these accounts also look forward to the end of the age when events will play out in a similar fashion only on a global scale and not just a national one. In the Exodus, it begins with the Egyptian empire that was the most powerful nation at the time. And it, uh, I have to just say this right here because I've been asking the Lord, you know, for a better understanding of what is the world. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, we're in the world, not of the world. You know, what is the world? And I know it's not just the terra firma, but it's the system. It's, you know, everything that... Uh, uh, goes on in in government everywhere we we live and the lord answered me with a little bit even more detail and he said egypt is the world and how he showed me is that egypt was the first civilization that was constructed designed and lived in for its own purpose and not for him so Egypt is the first civilization in total rebellion against him. Egypt was filled with foreign nationals. It wasn't just Egyptians and it wasn't just Hebrews, but many different nations, people lived there. Egypt was prosperous and partly due to the legacy of Joseph, who saved Egypt and the surrounding nations with the wisdom of God to store the grain during the approaching famine. The sons of Jacob also prospered in the land of Goshen, and as they prospered, Egypt prospered. But an evil king arose who desired to eliminate the sons of Jacob little by little, stirring fear and suspicion against them. The freedom and privilege the Israelites had was taken away, ultimately enslaving them. Does this sound familiar? Now God waited for the opportune time, waiting for his people to cry out to him for deliverance. We as a people will tolerate all kinds of things until it is intolerable. But when that time comes and we do cry out, Yah is listening for our voice. Israel lived in a pagan nation, surrounded by idols, rituals, and witchcraft dedicated to foreign gods being subject to laws based on despicable practices and strange beliefs while trying to maintain some hope and faith of the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible tells us <clears throat> the details of Moses' confrontations with Pharaoh and the dishonest and manipulative way that Pharaoh changed his mind ten times. Pharaoh was believed to be a god or the son of a god. In fact, he was most likely Nephilim or at least the descendant of Nephilim. Part of our struggle to understand judgment when it comes on the earth is due to the fact that we are afraid to really see what the scripture says and to believe what it actually means. Because of the rampant error and spiritual abuse of the Roman Catholic Empire, the Reformed churches drew a fence around what they were able to determine was safe and sound doctrine, and they taught subsequent generations never to go beyond what they were able to. <laughs> to do so was at your own peril, and you could become a heretic. I totally agree that we should not go beyond what is written. However, there are many things that they did not understand at that time that we can see more clearly now. 
And I thank God for scholars like Dr. Michael Heiser, who is now with the Lord, and researchers like Timothy Albarino, because they boldly declare truths that everyone else is afraid to. For far too long, difficult passages were explained away in a Sunday school manner to keep things simple and safe. But we are in a time of the end, and it is important for us to understand the story from the beginning to the end, or it will not make sense to us. There is a bigger story that is almost never told, and instead we, we focus on the smaller ones as individual and isolated accounts, and we miss the connections. As we have been going through Genesis on our Monday night, uh, Monday Midrash, it's helpful to recognize that uh, the things that brought judgment, the judgment of the flood, primarily the interference of the fallen angels with humans, and the intermingling of species, producing Nephilim, giants, or demigods. And here is our problem. We have been taught that the gods of old were just myths and fables, but mere myths and fables would not have provoked the God of heaven and earth to destroy all that is living on the earth except for eight people. The angels are unlike any other beings. They are not like humans. They are not like animals. They are not like extraterrestrials. They are Elohim. God is Elohim. God is spirit. The angels are spirit. Yahweh calls them Elohim or gods, to which he gave them power and authority to rule. But they abused that power and they defected from his kingdom. Psalm 82 gives us a peek into a rebuke of the Lord to these gods. And it would seem that the scripture reveals that the Lord chose to rule by counsel he presided over the regions that were given authority. They ruled with him, but as his regents, they were supposed to rule as Yahweh would rule, and then they did not. Since they abused their power, Yahweh declares that they will be made mortal and they will die like men. Which brings us back to Egypt. Moses was dealing with Pharaoh, but Yahweh was dealing with all of the gods of Egypt, not just idols of stone or images of gold, but the Elohim that they represented. One by one, he exposed their impotence in his presence. These were thought of as the life of Egypt. The people needed and depended on their benevolence to provide all the things needed to survive, from rain to crops, to children and healing. But when the creator showed up, where were they? Why were they unable to help the people who cried out to them? Because they were being judged and showing that they were not as powerful as the Egyptians believed, especially the sun god from whom the Pharaoh was supposed to be descended. Consider what the fallen ones have done on the earth since then. Adonai is very patient, and he has waited for the day of judgment, but they were warned by the plagues that came upon Egypt, and each plague was directed at one or more of the gods. The Lord knows what humanity is made of. He knows all of our weaknesses. And he knows how easily led astray we are by these beings who are powerful and more intelligent than we are. And so he does not want us to perish, but he has pity on us. And in so he sent his only begotten son to live a human existence, to fulfill all righteousness and become an atoning sacrifice to save us from our sins. The son of God, the true Elohim, made mortal to die on the cross for our sake, receiving in himself the full judgment. But on the third day in triumph, he rose and came out of the tomb, the firstborn from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep. His resurrection judged Satan and the fallen angels. And John tells us that the prince of this world has been judged. 
and even the world is judged, and the prince of this world will be cast out. He drew one third of the holy angels after him, causing them to fall. And in the garden, the woman was in transgression, but Yahweh Elohim declared it was the serpent or Hasatan who had done this. He wanted to be like the most high God, but he was corrupt and he ruined everything that he could. The Bible makes clear that all of these gods are on a leash. They can only do what Yah permits them to do. And in the end, judgment will come upon them for all that they have done. So let's remember Psalm 82 at verse 1. Elohim presides in the assembly of the mighty. He judges among the Elohim, or the gods. They are spirit, like Yahweh. They have innate power and are not just emotionless servants. They are called the sons of the Most High. Michael Heiser taught about the divine council, and it was a gathering of ruling angels before the Lord who presided over the council. Here they are called to account. They may be permitted to do evil, but they are never outside of the accountability for what they have done. Verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And then there's a Selah. We are privy to this conversation that takes place in heaven. And Elohim asks them, how long will they judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? The Selah or the pause is waiting for an answer. We can assume that this took place at least thousands of years ago. But look around you today, and I would say that they have not stopped doing this yet. This week, Anheuser-Busch came into the news because of the woke campaign, partnering with a transgender, even putting his image on the can. They immediately lost $5 billion. Not a smart business move to accommodate just 1% of the population, but they are not the ones calling the shots. The gods are. No. We see the faces of the world leaders that seem to be taking on an exalted place beyond what elected officials should have. But they are only the mere human representatives of fallen divinity. Is there partiality to the wicked? No. Why is the whole of society <laughs> being forced to change and bow to their delusions? In Canada, legislation has been put forward to form anti-free speech zones around drag queen story hours where offensive speech is forbidden. And if violated, the fines will go up to $25,000. <laughs> Matt Walsh from the Daily Wire was giving a lecture and a trans took the mic to try to offer a circular argument. He came back with, it is your right to believe whatever you want to believe, but it is not your right to force me to entertain your delusion. Many of the ancient gods were transvestites. This is nothing new. If the gods of Egypt were judged by the 10 plagues that Yahweh sent, each one directly associated with the God, then what kind of plagues will come upon the world to deal with what is happening now? Psalm 82, verse 3. Defend the weak, the poor, the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. But what is happening to our children, to the weak and the fatherless? They are prey for sick and twisted men and women that want to turn them into perverts like them for their own pleasure. The gods were to rescue the helpless from creatures like this. Now they are forced into this life through pressure from school administration and medical professionals. Young lives shattered and ruined, irreversibly damaged. Verse 5. They don't know, neither do they understand. They walk back and forth in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. 
I said, you are Elohim, you are gods. All of you are the sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like men and fall like one of the, the princes. Arise, Elohim, judge the earth, for you inherit all of the nations. So in the beginning of this, I said that we were hemmed in by the limited understanding of the scholars who have gone before us because they were afraid to err as Roman Catholicism did. But it is not error if the Ruach opens the scriptures to us and reveals something that is hidden for our generation. We know that Yeshua said with God, all things are possible, but do we really believe those words or do we insist that some things are really not possible? Elohim said in Psalm 82, verse 6 and 7, that even though they were angels, they were the sons of El Elyon, they would die like men. We know that the Son of God, Yahweh Yeshua, became a mortal man, that he might make atonement for our sins. So God himself became mortal. Why then is it so difficult to believe that Elohim will make good on his word and send even the fallen angels into a human existence at this time for the purpose of judgment. There's a reason why there are 8 billion people on this planet at this time. The 8 is foreshadowed in Noah, the 8 saved on the ark. We are in the process of the next global judgment, and there are 8 or 8 billion on the planet. And as I've said many times, Yah wants that none should perish, but that all would repent and come to him, trusting in Messiah. In every lifetime, there might be a legitimate excuse why a person is unable to be saved. They might have a really hard life or no opportunity to hear the gospel living in a country where the gospel has not yet come. Living in a time of apostasy, like the dark ages where the truth is hidden. When Peter asked, how many times are we to forgive our brother? Seven times? Yeshua answered, not seven times, but 70 times seven. God will forgive our transgressions, even from seven lifetimes, being 70 years, because that's what the Bible says. A man's life is 70 years, uh, 80 if there is strength. If we come to salvation, all will be forgiven. Paul was dealing with a lot of problems, particularly in Corinth. There were true believers in the congregation. There were people who were still trying to figure it out, and there were some who were not yet fully persuaded, and those who were what we would call seekers today. Definitely, definitely not saved, but they liked church. So one of those not saved guys did the unthinkable and he took his father's wife. However, the community did not discipline him. And it sounds like they kept this scandalous man in fellowship and Paul was aghast. He as an apostle, a prince in the kingdom, had the authority to hand the man over to Hasatan for the destruction of his flesh or the destruction of his body because he was unrepentant. Now, this is not the same thing as condemning him to hell. This is not the same thing as excommunicating him. This was to uh, break him, to shake him, to let him know that what he was doing was unholy and unrighteous. He couldn't be in the Christian community and do these things and be unrepentant. 1 Corinthians 5.4 in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you being gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ are to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So in the day of the Lord Jesus or Yeshua, the day of the Lord. First John five sixteen. if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. For those who sin not leading to death, there is a sin leading to death. And I don't say that you should make a request or pray about this. So those who come to the Lord's table without discerning, this is a holy memorial of Yeshua's death. Uh, they just ate the bread and drank the wine. 
and they did so to their own peril. So when you have a community like uh, Corinth, which is pretty much any church, pretty much anywhere now, um, there are some people that should not be taking communion and uh, people who are not true believers. In that day, many became sick and weak because of judgment, and some even died. 1 Corinthians 11.31 if we discerned ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. But when we are judged, we are punished by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So our Torah today and our half Torah told us a couple of things. That we can't approach the holy in any old way. We can't come close to God and think that we can be foolish if we come close to God and we don't have the blood of Christ, it puts us in a very perilous place. So let's think this through. No man was to partake of the Passover Seder who was not circumcised in the flesh. A person who partook of the covenant meal and was not circumcised in the heart or born again was violating the sacred and they came under judgment. So those who became ill or died were not yet saved. But Paul says that this punishment was so that they would not be condemned with the world. So then they must have had another opportunity to live and receive Messiah and be saved. So at the end of the world, uh, they would come into the time of judgment, but they would be saved at that point. They did not reject the knowledge of the truth, but they did not personally receive him either. They were not apostate. They were fence sitters. They had not made a choice. It is the father that determines at what point we will come to faith. We have an appointment. We know Yeshua walked through the gate beautiful many, many times. And he walked right past the blind beggar who sat there for years. In the day of his appointment, Peter and John stopped and the man was healed. Yeshua spoke to a certain person at a certain time that was appointed for them. Those who are not yet saved today will not be saved until the tribulation begins. They are appointed to this time for salvation that they may not be judged with the world. Perhaps these people are like Thomas, who uh, today we would be reading that text today, where uh, Thomas did not believe the witnesses that said that Messiah had been raised. Instead, he refused, and he uh, dug his heels in and said, unless I can put my fingers in the holes and my hand into his side I will not believe he needed to see to believe perhaps they need to see the book of revelation come alive all around them and see the saints taken in harpazo in order to believe whatever the reason their decisions or their lack thereof has got them assigned to be saved at this time at the end of the age. So in this terminal generation, we have the saints who have been saved and are waiting for his coming, among which may be some of the original apostles whom Messiah said in Matthew 16, 28, most certainly I tell you, there are some standing here who will in no way taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And Mark adds, with power. References of the coming kingdom with power are at the end of the age. A promise made to them that they would live at a time to see his coming, to see his return. There are, there are those... Uh, also who are not yet saved, awaiting their appointed time. And then there are the wicked who are here for the purpose of judgment. Those who have utterly rejected the offer of salvation, who love darkness. I believe the Lord has taught me that many of the wicked people on the earth at this time 
are the fallen ones who have been sent here to become mortal flesh, just as Yahweh promised them in Psalm 82. But when you gather together so much wickedness at one time, the whole world suffers. This is why the martyrs cry out for justice in Revelation chapter 6. Most have died long ago. Uh, punishing the world right now would not avenge them unless those who persecuted them and tortured them and killed them were alive on the earth to now bear his wrath. This is not resurrection of the unrighteous, but these are born into a fleshly existence that they may live in the mortal confines and weakness of humanity and die like men. This may explain why it is a time that is worse than any other since man was on the earth, we have a concentration of the most wicked of all time. So the gods were real beings, but they were not like our God. Remember, Paul says, for us, there is only one God. He doesn't deny that there are gods out there. He just says, for us, there is only one King Solomon said in 2 Chronicles 2.4, The house that I am about to build will be great, because our Elohim is greater than all the Elohim. Yahweh had given the nations to the sons, to the Elohim, to rule for him. When they rebelled and they did not do so justly, he sought a people for himself. Should all choose him instead of the gods of the world? returning to the Father, returning to heaven. The plagues of Egypt showed the Egyptians that these gods that they depended on were no match for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the deity that they conveniently left out of all of their mythology. The book of Revelation contains plagues that are similar in fashion, but not chronology to the Exodus. Such plagues as boils, blood, hail, lightning, even some creatures that resemble locusts and frogs and also darkness. So what took place in Egypt was a foreshadow of the judgments that would come on these gods at the end of the days when they stood in fragile flesh. Today we remember our Lord Yeshua, the firstborn from the dead as he returned on the eighth day of the Omer to save Thomas, the man who walked with him and even declared that they should all go to Jerusalem and die with him. Yet he could not believe that he was raised from the dead. Yeshua's invitation to reach out and touch the nail prints and put his hand in his side is more than grace. It is extended mercy on his unbelief. Yah did not want him to perish, but because he dug in his heels and refused to believe him without seeing. Finally, Thomas is able to acknowledge him as my Lord and my God. But Yeshua's next words are sad. John 20, 29. Yeshua said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 1 Peter 1, 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you trust him and are filled with a joy that is glorious beyond words, receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we who have believed and not seen are his beautiful spotless bride, and we shall be caught away soon to the wedding of the Lamb. The tribulation saints, loved and forever saved, will be the guests at the wedding. Still sons and daughters, but not in the same relationship as the bride. So more blessed are those who have believed and not seen. But this is the time for judgment to be implemented upon the fallen angels. And this belongs to him who triumphed over them through his death and resurrection. Colossians 2.13 You were dead through your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive together with him, 
having forgiven us all our trespasses and wiping out the handwriting and ordinances which was against us. He has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Having stripped the principalities and the powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He is coming to mete out recompense, not only on wicked humanity, but on the gods of old. Revelation 12, 7. There was a war in the sky, and Michael and his angels made war on the dragon, and the dragon and his angels made war. They didn't prevail, neither was a place found for them anymore in heaven, so they're grounded. The great dragon was thrown down, the old serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation, the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them before our God day and night. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even to death. The Lord himself begins by grounding them who are still in the air, in the atmosphere. And as they are cast down to the earth, the enemy is powerless before the great king as in the days of the Exodus. Instead of being humiliated before the people, as in Egypt, they will be the ones upon whom these judgments come. Even the dragon, the old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole earth, will come to his incarceration. He will be bound for a thousand years and cast into the abyss and sealed till after the thousand years are finished, and then he will be loosed one last time for a short space. Our Parsha today, interestingly, is called Shemini, or eight. There were eight on the ark. There are eight billion in the world. Thomas encountered Yeshua on the eighth day. Leviticus tells us of the sons of Aaron, priests who had been intoxicated, as it is implied, who disobeyed and irreverently offered incense or strange fire, and they were consumed where they stood. They were judged for daring to come into Yah's presence in such a manner, and Aaron warned, was warned not to mourn them. The half Torah is about Uzzah, who sought to study the ark, being transported on a new cart up to Jerusalem. But who was he to lay his hand upon the holy, even if his motives were pure? The whole situation came out of disobedience because of the cart. We cannot come to God in any way that we wish. We cannot offer worship in the manner that suits us. He is holy. And we think that because he is good and merciful and full of loving kindness, that he won't judge anyone. The fact is Yeshua longed for the day of judgment to come. Luke 12, 49. I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, no I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. There will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The separation of believers and non-believers, even in one household, the sheep and the goats. We don't need to grieve the loss of the wicked, but pray for the endurance and perseverance of the saints. We pray for the day of salvation, that it be at hand for those who are entering the great tribulation. They will suffer, but even, but if they do not seek to save their lives by taking the mark, they will save them, and they will be warmly welcomed into heaven. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work, 
It is the false Christ that has come into the house of God and into our nation to tear down truth. This is the roaring lion looking for those he may devour, who imitates the Lord Yeshua, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But what will this plague be like, this judgment? Truth will not be something that they can find anymore. Delusion is the judgment. They will love the lie, and so they will believe the lie that drags them into the pit. They will not be able to understand the Bible, and they will never know the truth again. For when they did hear it, they mocked it, they rejected it, they loved darkness, and they hated the light. In this modern era, we have seen World War I, World War II, and the Holocaust. It brought the rise of communism and the fall of monarchy. Many other international wars and cold wars, the, the wars and rumors of wars. Socialism that fostered anti-God government. The Nazi attempt to destroy Yahweh's people and to ethnically cleanse the world did not work. And since then, they have patiently and systematically worked to indoctrinate society with rebellion and disobedience generation by generation in order to weaken us so that they can accomplish their plan. Ephesians 2.1, you were made alive when you were dead in transgression and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we also all once lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The sound of war is beating in the world, and we have those in power that are deconstructing us, making masculinity toxic, effeminizing men, depleting our munitions and military capability, causing us to be weak and vulnerable to our enemies. And once we are no longer able to protect ourselves, they poke the bear and antagonize the dragon. They will destroy us with little effort, and all of this by design. They have prepared places for themselves, whole underground cities to be inhabited by the elite when the destruction comes. Even the Bible describes them going into caves and mountains to be safe, but they will become tombs, for there is no place to hide from him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Yahweh has weighed the churches, the separating of wheat and chaff, the determination of who is barley, those that are rapture ready, and who are the wheat, the tribulation saints. There are three times as much barley as there is wheat. The last is oil and wine, the olive and the grape. Israel is the olive tree, and the wicked are the vine of the earth, and they will be judged after the church. If Uzzah was struck down for just laying his hand on the ark with a pure motive, what will happen to those who mock God openly in the pulpits as they do so freely today? Men dressed as whores, placing women on, on the cross, mocking the death of Jesus, insulting the spirit of truth and grace. We are in the green agenda, the climate change, the false logic that gives them a platform to institute radical change like the Great Reset. This final phase of their agenda began with a worldwide manufactured plague that would trigger a domino effect, destroying economies, taking away freedoms and the systematic destruction of world food production. We are in the green horse phase. This will continue until one quarter of the population is killed and the rest are prepared for the beast to come. Vengeance belongs to the Lord and we know that he will deal with our enemies. One of the first judgments meted out in the day of the Lord is the prayers of the saints being cast to the earth. I believe that our, our prayers for the tribulation saints are stored up and will avail them much in that terrible time. But included in that censor, the angel cast to the earth is the cry of the martyred saints for justice on the wicked who shed their blood. 
the angel with the censer of incense added the prayers of all the saints. Revelation 8, 5. The angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and he threw it on the earth. Thunder sounds, thunders, sounds, lightnings, and an earthquake followed. Satan had convinced one third of the angels to follow him. It's interesting that in the judgments of Revelation, the destruction and the death is in one thirds. It is God who so perfectly repays his enemies. That is why we can trust him to judge righteously. He gives all opportunity to return to him in peace, in shalom. But if we are not willing, then he is left with no choice. Remember, hell was designed for Satan and his angels as a place of punishment for a reason. As I was preparing this message, I felt like, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing or where I'm going with this. I started out with an idea, but it just wasn't formulating. I mean, I was going step by step, but I felt unsteady about it. And the Holy Spirit would reassure me that I was on the right path. And I had a, a general sense of what I was trying to write, but I couldn't see it through all the way to the end of the message. And then Friday morning, it came to me. I feel like I'm in the wilderness. And the Holy Spirit immediately interjected and being led by a pillar of cloud by day. Exactly, just follow me. <laughs> so it's hard to follow when it's different than what we have known. But Yeshua also brought new light to verses that uh, they thought they understood in that day. But when they weren't willing to consider his words, they condemned him instead. Yeshua had many things he wanted to say to us, but as the body of Christ, we needed to mature in the spirit first because we couldn't bear it or handle it. But when I know that it's his word and I know that it's the Holy Spirit, I will stand in what he has shown me and not just take the safe or familiar road. I will follow the shepherd, my pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. So I think that this is our takeaway. We may not be able to see clearly to the end. We may not be able to figure out all the timelines and all the sequences of events, but we all can do the best that we can as we seek understanding. But as long as we follow him and we trust in his goodness and his justice, we will do just fine. We are longing for home where we will all gather together with no more fear or torment in our souls like Lot who was tormented every day because of the things that were all around him. Wickedness must be removed and Yahweh will do it. And so we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. O Yeshua.